As the decade turned, a new species of artist had evolved out of the folk rock scene in the mid-60s, the singer-songwriter. Pretty much a uniquely 70s trope, the image of the starving artist pining away in a garret, singing intimate songs of love, loss, yearning and environmental concern, or the carefree hippie freak decrying the man and calling for us all to get together out in the country, is an easy and pervasive go-to, but from a 50-year distance it now seems a lot more diverse, complex, contradictory and fun. But it was also fraught, because for the first time in pop, gender distinctions began to define the tenor of the music, and it was also the first genre, the first stake within the industry which even attempted to offer a new role and new validity to female artists. The most successful of the early 70s female singer-songwriterly types was Carole King, whose 1971 album Tapestry was, until Saturday Night Fever came along, the biggest selling album of all time. Of the generation of songwriters made hugely redundant by the emergence of the self-contained songwriting unit that was the rock band, Carole King, frequently in partnership with her husband, Gary Goffin, was perhaps the greatest of them. I guess that's the first contradiction, really, in it's hard to think of King as an artist in a garret living only for her poetry when she's got the royalties for the locomotion stacking up in the bank. That said, and I'll make a hot call, Carol King is, with the sad passing of Burt Bacharach, the greatest living American popular songwriter. Perhaps Jimmy Webb is the only other person who might have such a claim. Tapestry dominated the charts for two and a half years from its release, selling an unprecedented 15 million copies and spending 302, count them, 302 consecutive weeks on the Billboard Top 200. Of non-compilation albums, only Dark Side of the Moon has spent more consecutive weeks on the US album charts, and amongst women, only Adele's 21 has charted for more weeks in total than Tapestry. It was the second biggest seller of 1971, after the Jesus Christ Superstar soundtrack, and it's hard to compete with Jesus, and 1972, after Neil Young's Harvest, not quite the same, and made the top 25 for 1973. In finally removing the singer-songwriter movement from its dependence on hippie sensualism and its florid imagery, Tapestry owes much of its success to two factors. Lou Adler's tidy, intimate production, which pushes King's warm and fussy piano to the forefront and allowed her genuine vocals to go direct to the listener, and King's peerless gift for melody and her ear for a hook. Take as an example the opener, the rollicking I Hear the Earth Move, and the priceless pop craft that transitions chorus to verse to the bridge and the chorus. The song is so good you don't notice things like that happening until you go back and take the deep listen, ignoring all of the delights on the surface. That song spent five weeks at number one in the US, although to be fair, most of the airplay was for the B-side, It's Too Late. For the album, which is so readily acknowledged as the leader of the singer-songwriter pack, it doesn't really share that much with the other leading lights in the genre. Certainly it has a warm, domestic feel to the arrangements, but King's girl group pedigree comes through in the backing vocals, and it'll be a good few years before Joni Mitchell would try a guitar solo as wibbly as the one on I Feel the Earth Move, or as funky as the one on It's Too Late. It's also very frank in its sexual politics. King is a model of what would have been seen as an independent single woman. She's horny as hell on Earth Move, although Laura Nero had covered many similar conversations, both sexual desire and dependence on her first three albums. It's Too Late weighs her naturally romantic outlook with her determination to maintain her independence and her options, although she throws all this out the window with the delightfully dippy and really outlying where you lead. She recasts Will You Love Me Tomorrow from the knife-edge risk versus reward of teenage belief in the redeeming power of true love to the genuine fear of being discarded under the same rules of the same game she played in It's Too Late. Joni Mitchell, by the way, sings back up on this, and to this very day, if you press Carol King's front doorbell, it will play Will You Love Me Tomorrow. The spine of the album, Home Again, Way Over Yonder, Beautiful, You've Got a Friend, and the oddly placed tapestry is where the secret strength lies. Sweetly tuneful, impeccably crafted and sincerely presented songs that fill the space around the listener and shut the world outside down for a few minutes. And of course it ends with one of the greatest pieces of theatre in You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman. This song is a miracle. King and Jerry Goffin were walking down Broadway, and Jerry Wexler, from Atlantic Records, trying to put together Aretha Franklin's label debut, shouted at them from his car that he wanted them to write him a song about a natural woman, and he wanted it quickly. King and Goffin went home to New Jersey, had their supper, put the kids to bed, sat down on the piano, and wrote the song there and then. 
They took it to Wexler the next day, and he loved it. A few days later, Wexler calls him and asks him in. He tells them that he offered it to Aretha Franklin. She loved it, and in fact had recorded it that day. And he played them the acetate. Ralph Burns had turned the song into a beast. Massive, explosive, muscular. Four years later, King doesn't have that voice, and she doesn't have that framework to work in. So she strips it back, showing all her vocal fragility and its rawness, its testimony to her. And the spirit of this great record is that she can invest so much in someone else's lyrics, in a song she knows was written in a couple of hours for a request. Tapestry is one of the high watermarks of the 1970s for songcraft, authentic performance, the triumph of the less is more school of production, and as a sibboleth that identified the voice of women uncertain of their standing in the new so-called me generation. But foremost as she may be remembered, King was a passenger in a movement. Coming out of the 1960s, Joni Mitchell and Laura Nero Mitchell, through her clear-eyed narration of her journey through experience over four albums, an uncertain debut, the contemplation of a flood of new experiences in clouds, her growing confidence in building on those experiences with Ladies of the Canyon, and the price you pay for going through all of that and how you come out of it in her most frequently praised album, Blue. Songs such as the darkly poetic Roses Blue, the vibrant Chelsea Morning, which is the best example I can think of of the hippie sensualism that I talked about before, the nervous game of I Don't Know Where I Stand, and the sassy, sexy song about the Midway, about Mitchell being charmed by that old smoothie Leonard Cohen in 1967, the title track of Ladies of the Canyon, which enumerated the options and possibilities open to an independent woman at the turn of the decade, the conversation where the simplicity of speech hides a series of layered relationships, or the title track of Blue, the harrowing account of good times and harsh prices paid, which leads us through an album of songs in which change, loss, sorrow and opportunity are all intimately linked by Mitchell's total lack of emotional filter. The transition out of the confessional mode, and more on that problematic term shortly, began with 1972's For the Roses, and through her biggest seller, 1974's Caught and Spark, before she launched her brilliant mid-70s trilogy of The Hissing of Summer Lawns, which is my personal favourite, Hegira, and Don Juan's Reckless Daughter. 1979's Mingus saw her ambition for the first time outstrip her resources, and she drifted through the 80s and 90s largely as an afterthought. In 1970, Laura Nero released her fourth album, Christmas and the Beads of Sweat, which was the closest thing she'd ever had to a hit thus far, making number 51 and containing her only single to make the top 100. Fittingly, a Carol King song, a cover of Up on the Roof. King, in her Brill Building incarnation, was one of Nero's most naked inspirations. Christmas was part progression from her brilliant New York Tenderberry, with its moody and tingling atmospheres and the more upbeat, soul-influenced sounds of 1968's Eli and the 13th Confession. Nero's first three records released between 1967 and 1969 were remarkable documents of a young life spent relentlessly experimenting and exploring of heartbreak and defiance, frank and lusty celebrations of her voracious sexuality, which included a daringly barely disguised bisexuality, her adventures and misadventures with her heroin habits, her complicated relationship with her mother and her bouts with depression and mania. Her music was a wild melange of show tunes, R&B, folk balladry, 1960s girl group pop, Ray Charlesian gospel hysteria and Streisandish schmaltz, and resulted in songs which provided 11 hit singles for other artists. Nero followed Christmas with Gonna Take a Miracle, a labour of love covering her doo-wop R&B and brill-building influences that was her only top 50 album. But in 1973, things got difficult for Laura when she unaccountably snubbed her best friend, manager and mentor, David Geffen, and re-signed with Columbia instead of being the marquee first signing for Asylum Records. Geffen turned his attention to the new jewel in his crown, Joni Mitchell, and Laura quite quickly faded from the radar. She released Smile in 1976 and the now hard-to-find Nested in 1978, before she went into a semi-retirement to raise her son. It's only now, really, more than 25 years after her death in 1997, that critics seem to have taken up Laura's cause, but I shall forever sing it from the rooftops. Laura was a goddess, a golden, shining goddess. There should have been building statues to her, dedicating great ships and bridges. There should be gardens grown in her name, schools founded in her honour, and the capital cities of a few mid-sized countries renamed to reflect her. Henceforth, all kittens born should be named Laura. Credible poets must be employed to write nothing but love poems to her. 
Barbara Streisand made a fortune murdering her stony end, and when Maura died, she was an obscure footnote still tainted by the utter and untrue myth that she flopped at Monterey in 1967. But on the bad nights and early mornings when I was so very ill recently, I had New York Tenderberry to get me through. So I say God bless Laura Nero. So, while King refined and tightened the focus around how women represented their lives on records, there arose in her wake, either by dint of her inspiration or by record companies looking to find acts to meet a new market, a second wave of female singer-songwriters. Most successful was no doubt Carly Simon, who was a chart regular for the first half of the decade with her little bit of Joni, a little bit of Laura songs, sung in a warm mezzo. Janice Ian, like Laura, something of a child prodigy, had a number one single with the gloomy bedroom folk of At 17 and its attendant album Between the Lines in 1975, and she had a few good more years after that. The hardest rocking of the initial wave was Racine, Wisconsin's own Shy Coltrane, who pummeled her piano like a fevered Ray Charles and sang in a gritty and dynamic voice. She had two noteworthy albums, 1972's thrilling self-titled debut and the more introspective but no less rock and let it roll in 1974. She was, and still is, a huge star in Europe with several number one hits in Holland and Germany and her comeback concert in Vienna attracted 90,000 people. Judy Sills showed significant potential. Her album Heart Food is a unique take on all the tropes we've seen through this essay. She was a troubled soul though and she took her own life in 1979. Warren Zevon was a huge fan of hers and covered her Jesus Was a Crossmaker on his Mutineer album. UK and other artists too few channels like this cover, Joan Armatrading, made five quietly impressive albums showing consistent growth both musically and in the scope of her ambition, and that set the stage for a very profitable first half of the 1980s. Finally, one of the odd little acts we'll see in this survey, Ricky Lee Jones, a sort of an offshoot of Laura Nero and the long-gone vaudevillian tradition of her own family, put out a fantastic eponymous album in 1979. While she tended to gravitate to character sketches and stories, songs like On Saturday Afternoons in 1963 and Last Chance Texaco are as unguarded and relentlessly self-scrutinising as anything on Blue. Her masterpiece, though, was 1981's Pirates, a sprawling epic of her breakup with Tom Waits and her struggle to regain her individual identity in the wake. Unlike everyone else who we've covered in this essay, though, Jones has remained consistently interesting throughout her career, applying her wistful jazz folk styling with the occasional odd and delightful hard ride into places you'd hardly expect. These women made a priceless and indelible contribution, not only to the immediate culture of the music in the 1970s, but in the legacy of the 1970s as derived from its music as a whole. It's lazy tagging, but these women are usually lumped together under the term confessional singer-songwriters. It's hard to think of a man who attracts such a term. It comes from particularly albums like Eli and the Thirteenth Confession or Especially Blue, which are literal readings of the songwriter's day-to-day -day or even minute-to-minute -minute actions, feelings and reactions to situations. Nero's all-too-palpable shame and anger in Stony End, again, Streisand's cover of this surely ranks as one of the dumbest, most meat-headed covers ever, which must have so disappointed Laura. Or her half-desperate, half-hopeful trawl for heroin in Gibson Street, or Mitchell's slow opening revelation of her affair with Leonard Cohen in Rainy Nighthouse, or her ruined rumination on the wonderful last time I saw Richard on Blue. King took the same approach, tamed it and made it seem a little more suburban, and therefore relatable and mainstream, but did so with equal frankness and equal zeal. Lately, though, the term confessional is seen to be problematic. Joni Mitchell has long rallied against it, describing being called confessional as close to someone could come to calling her the N-word. Mitchell explained, perfectly reasonably, that confession was always associated with two factors, coercion and sin, and that, combined with the fact that the title is almost exclusively given to female artists, to me that implies there's still a constraint on and consequence for women defining the terms of their own lives and expressing their own experience in terms of that. The swing light bulb and the bully club, as Joni put it. Taylor Swift did much the same thing in 2014, pointing out that her style was comparable with any number of male singer-songwriters who elicited no such criticism. Desire, fallible fidelity, ambition, the seeking of experience, the abomination of war, as popular music started to turn the personal into the political, these became the subjects male singer-songwriters were allowed to declare, but females were forced to confess. It was indicative of the state of women in the industry then, 
but the association is redundant these days, and the success of female singer-songwriters in establishing a unique and credible form justifies its retirement and its consignment forever to the 70s. Getting us underway, 250 is the band that outsold the Beatles in their home country in 1970, Fleetwood Mac with the Green Manalishi with the Two Prong Crown. Ill-fated Andy Gibb, arguably the best singer and best looking of the Gibb brothers, had a huge hit with the pop perfection of I Just Want to Be Your Everything in 1977. There is no legend in Australian rock as colourful, diverse and on occasions hilarious as Billy Thorpe. Most people I know is his anthem, his theme song, hitting number two in early 1973. Thorpe is saying with gusto, the best set closer for any Australian act, right up to his death in 2007. Monty Python's Always Look on the Bright Side of Life is a great little song that deserves more than to be treated as a novelty or a mere comedy record. Australia was the only English-speaking country where this charted, topping out at number nine. Back in the pre-Highway to Hell era, ACDC was seen as a pop band in Australia. Top 40, Countdown, TV Week, Pull Out Posters, Pop Band. High Voltage made the top 10 locally and is still the go-to song for kids starting out practicing in garages up and down the land. Courtney Barnett needs to cover this immediately. 245, a recurring theme in this countdown will be that maximalist spectacle, ambition and innovation were the hallmarks of music in the 70s. But simplicity equally had its place and it's the perfect and simple bad man's reflection of New Speedway Boogie, where the Grateful Dead look back on the long strange trip post Altamont and see a light at the end. Sometimes ABBA's songs were so good, so amazingly well polished that we didn't listen to them as records. Mamma Mia is a prime example, a marvellously detailed and subtle arrangement and production with a killer melody and not bittersweet but sweet bitter vocal. A masterpiece. Clash City Rockers, fierce, who-like with a brilliant middle eight. This was the middle song in a trilogy of 1977 singles that all make this list. Ann Peebles was a tiny little singer from Memphis with a great big voice who made some of the best records for the last great soul holdout, High Records. 99 Pounds is a scorching hot great record, belting out a raw gut bucket stomper. 241, Jean-Michael Jarret was a groundbreaking French arranger. His layered synth sounds supporting perky melodies, which were tremendously influential in the development of how music was to be made thereon, and Oxygene led that way. In 1978, the labels were on the scout for an American-friendly punk band, and the police seemed to fit that bill. There are a few better police songs, but Walking on the Moon reminds me of my first girlfriend, so here it stays. 239, say it in hushed tones, but there are days when I prefer Trans Europa Express to Autobahn. 238, when the levee breaks, Led Zeppelin, skull-crushing brutality of the finest stripe here. For all the ingenious tuning Page uses and the onslaught unleashed on Bonham's drums, it's a Zepp secret weapon, John Paul Jones, whose ominous, hovering and doom portentous bass hangs the whole thing together. Page is the lightning, Bonham the thunder, and Jones the earthquake prior to Armageddon. Rainwright the Third's Dead Skunk is a song of childhood sing-alongs in the back of a station wagon to a tinny AM radio on the rough and broken road from Acrobat to Capalabar with headlights bobbling up and down in the gloom. 236, Dancing on a Saturday Night by Barry Blue. From 1971 to 1974, my life was glam rock. Ah, what the hell, it still is really. I can bang on all I like about German space rock or obscure 30s bluesmans or 50s tenement, but in my heart of hearts, glam rock is my musical comfort food. This record is, not to draw too long a bow, the gimme gimme good lovin' of the 1970s. 235, The Four Tops, Are You Man Enough? Was there life after Motown for the Mighty Four Tops? Yeah, betcha sweet bippy there was, from the in no way racially exploitative movie, Shaft in Africa. The title track of Nick Drake's final album, Pink Moon, is a compelling document of a man who knows not only the black dog, but knows its name, the stink of its breath, and the feel of its teeth. It's a song made twice as sad knowing poor Nick's terrible fate. Still crazy after all these years, a mega hit album in 1975 was Paul Simon's glossy and most contemporary sounding record yet, and the title track has a hard-worn authenticity in its story, polished to a sheen by Simon and Phil Ramone, who despite impressive pre-qualifications was not a member of the Ramones. 232, this may seem harsh, but I think sometimes more pretentious ex post facto twaddle has been written and pontificated about Joy Division than any other band. The legacy of their first album is, however, impressive, being one of the pillars, along with Sheffield's BEF, 
of British synth-pop bands. Disorder is a great album opener, a great statement of intent and a tribute to the real hero of Joy Division, their producer, the late heroin-loving Martin Hannett. The music of Brazil cannot be discussed without mention of Milton Nascimento. His 1972 album Clube de Esquina is basically a folk record with some jazzy touches and Milton's high sweet voice reminding people living under Brazil's menacing junta of Tudo Crevocho Podia Ser, All That You Can Be.